I think that's going to save some of my presentation. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to go through all of that. So thank you very much for that. And thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to move through this pretty quickly. My goal here is not to really describe the Global Swim project per se, but really to give you some of the knowledge that I've gained over the past five years, and then open it up to a Q&A, because that's really what I'm about. It's more sharing that information rather than me just talking to you. So let's see if this works. Yay, before we start. So these are my views, and I really want to stress that because I know we have a lot of experience in the room, and we have a lot of different kinds of thoughts and different things that people think, um, different experiences. And I'm just going to give what I have, and then that's where that conversation starts and the Q&A. Um, Usually when I start things, I really talk about safe spaces, but safe spaces is not the classical safe space. I'm more interested in being challenged, but being challenged in a way which is positive. So I always say we're here to lift each other up, not tear each other down. And I say this in pretty much everything I do. So if you hear somebody say something, you have to know that it's coming from a positive place. I receive it in a positive place, and then we can actually talk about it. And some of the terminology will be sensitive because in these topics, we throw around these words all the time. Some people like them, some people don't. So I'm just going to do what I do and use the terminology and try and be as respectful as I can. And I welcome being corrected by anybody in the room, as well as pronunciation of names and words and all those kind of things. So is everybody good with that? Cool. And it's still working. And you heard all this, so we're good. <laughs> but um, just to stress, one of the things coming to Aotearoa New Zealand is that for one of the first times in my lives, I was or my life, I was forced to look at my heritage. Because a lot of us who are colonized, we actually have our heritage cut, our language is cut. My country is St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the Caribbean. It only became um, independent in 1979. Very, very recent. All of those heritage, so Portuguese, West African, Northern Indian, all collided in that area. So we essentially recreated our own culture because those cultures were taken away from us. And then moving to Canada. so. I am very multicultural. I would also stand as a member of my global village because I've traveled so much, but also in the way I think. And finally, I'm here in New Zealand five years with my lovely wife, my two stepchildren, and we are a multi-ethnic household. So we have um, Pakistani, West Indian, Dutch, Canadian, Maori in our house. And we balance all of that. So it's a pretty interesting journey. Without, you saw, heard the credentials, so that's awesome. This is actually who I am. I'm that underwater guy. That's where I'm best at home. Sailing, those are some students uh, from Korea. If I have any excuse to get on the water with my students, I do, because I believe that water connects us. And I've been doing that for years and years. And I also have that background in marine parks management as well. But more recently, that whole water safety thing has taken over because, again, water connects us. And I don't like people seeing people die in the water. Um, so getting that message out there is really, really important to me. And I'm also an educator. So I've been doing this for the past 20 odd years, mainly focused on young people, but um, very much from diverse backgrounds. So Korea, Sweden, Egypt, and now New Zealand. These guys down here, this is a project, this is not the only thing I do. So this is a project I'm doing right now called Global Ambassadors. These are all young people from Tauranga and Western Bay of Plenty all working together, and they call the shot. So we provide the structure underneath them, and they say what they need, what they want to do. And again, that's what I'm about. So it's really, I think it's really important that you understand all that, because when I talk about this, this has really been a life journey for me. So what I want to do is give you an idea of the past five years, but I really want to talk about how that applies to the industry from my point of view, what I've seen on my journey since I came here five years ago. And this whole idea of the Global Swim Project encourages, supports, and advocates for greater justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion related to aquatics and water safety. Mouthful. But that has been an evolution over five years of where I really think I am at and where I think the industry needs to go. The Global Swim Project focuses on three specific areas. So the idea of community, the idea of global perspective, looking out there to inform what we're doing here, because quite frankly, if you think you've developed something new, somebody's probably already done it. And the idea of working with industry to bring that knowledge through. So let's start. Anybody familiar with the term Jedi? 
apart from the movies. <laughs> so that whole idea of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, it's new. It's been around for a couple of years. I think it's been around for longer than that, but more widely used over the past couple of years as I've been doing research. And um, you know DEI, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and then it used to be diversity and inclusion. So we keep changing these names and using these names. And there are some people who think we shouldn't use that because it's too close to the actual Jedi. But I think the Jedi are pretty diverse, but I'm not going there. It has nothing to do with the Jedi at all. It actually has to do with thinking about how we think about being together. So I'm really, really quickly going to do this. This is my interpretation of it. This is why I use it. And happy to talk about it afterwards as well. But I think of it in a stair capacity. It is not a linear thing, but this is how you can kind of wrap your head around it. The idea of diversity, difference. That's essentially it. You can have lots of diversity without inclusion. The idea of people being included in what you're doing. You can have lots of inclusion without equity. And the reason I think equity is really, really important, and this is over the past five years I've been developing this idea, the talk about equity being fairness and everybody there, I like going back to the financial side of it, a share, that people feel like they actually belong and have a part of what you're doing. That stretches into the boardroom right through to um, your clients. And then the idea of justice. And again, there's some argument as to whether justice should be a part of this or not. I personally believe that justice needs to be part of the New Zealand Foundation. The reason for that is twofold. Human rights, elements of justice. The Treaty of Waitangi, elements of justice. In our context here, asking people, please come join us to something that they already should have a part of and own kind of doesn't go over well. So the idea of acknowledging justice and acknowledging that as part of what makes us all together. Accessibility is something that I believe in very much, but accessibility for me doesn't extend into community. You can have a facility that's, that's accessible, but nobody goes there. You need other stuff. Welcoming is really important, and the idea of belonging and these kind of, so there's a web of all this stuff. It's hard. It takes time to understand, but really getting a general sense of this stuff is really important. But the big one I want to highlight is that term justice. So justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in aquatics. For me, this whole journey started 2018 when I was supporting the Bay of Plenty water safety strategy. I did interviews with community. I think it was 30-something interviews, everything from community to industry people. What do we need in the Bay of Plenty? And I came out with this diagram. That's what I thought was missing. The idea that it takes a village. It takes all of us together to reduce drowning tolls and water-related water accidents. And the idea of community, the individual and the family, seeing all three together, not just one. So often in water safety, we focus on the individual. The others are equally important. So that led me on a journey of about three or four years, and I'm not going to go into everything that we've done, but about 1,300 people served. I can't even tell you how many workshops with different communities. The thing I'll highlight is that every single one of these is a mission in and of itself, because you have to go to the community, have that conversation. It's not, I have something to give you. It's, I have something to offer. What do you need? And sit down. Every single one of these is co-created and co-delivered. I'll highlight, and I was really glad for the accessibility panel, and you'll hear a lot of this coming through this one. Um, Default Aero have had the good fortune of being able to work with them twice now. Eye-opening eye -opening in that the knowledge that they bring into the room, which is really, really, really important because they have something to offer as well, their perspectives, how they see the world. And for me, bouncing off of that and being humbled by the fact that I was having a conversation, not just teaching what I know to improve them. And that's essentially what I've been doing. Down here, Korean moms, um, specifically from Tauranga, done a lot of stuff, done a lot of learning. And coming out with this idea of understanding, respect, and community as a framework for water safety in everything that I present, whether it be for professionals or somebody who's brand new, that's what I'm presenting. And specifically this one, 
you should be protecting yourself and protecting the person beside you because they're your neighbor. You are part of this community. So you start to see that this spills over well beyond water safety into who we are as a people. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I don't want to step on Dr. Phillips' toes. She's going to be presenting this tomorrow, nor can I, because my job is not to actually teach anything to do with this. The reason why I talk about this is because when this first came out, I was really interested and I took a deep dive. Read the paper, had the good fortune of talking to Dr. Phillips and other practitioners of modern water safety and um, modern aquatics, and it took me on a real journey because Number one, from a water safety point of view, that view really did resonate with me as a person of ethnic background, as a person from a different place. But the second thing was, what is my role as a person of ethnic background in engaging with this model and engaging with Maori? And that has spilled over into other things I do because I work in that ethnic space a lot as well. And we have these conversations of how should we be approaching this as people of ethnic diversity? And then this has led me into a whole different thing of thinking about what is this thing we call swimming? Because the two pictures below are actually the place where I learned to swim. And those are some of the boys in the West Indies jumping off the rocks. Nobody gave them swimming lessons. The picture above, indigenous peoples who live in the water and are completely adapted to it. Nobody taught them to swim. Anybody seen this movie? Yet? Yeah, no? We really need to see this movie. Um, this is uh, the Duke, um, surfer, but also I didn't realize he was a competitive swimmer. And why was he able to beat an entire crowd of swimmers on his first go with no formal training in Hawaii? There's an innate, natural thing of aquatics that is within us, and I question whether we're actually tapping into it right now? What are the pathways? Because swimming and swimming lessons were a barrier for me growing up. And I got into swimming later on. So what does that look like? So that kind of leads us into this whole idea of looking out there globally for what's out there and thinking a little bit bigger. And I think one of the panelists mentioned um, picking up the phone and cold calling people. I do that a lot. So I will contact people from around the world and say, hey, I'd like to have a conversation I want to learn. And a lot of the time, they pick up and say yes. So I do have this um, series online called Diversity in Aquatics, because I thought I'm having these conversations, so I'll record them. And if everybody agrees, I'll put it up. And I've done quite a lot of them to date. Uh, a whole bunch of different stuff. These are two that really hit me. The one in the top corner is a former colleague of mine from Korea who actually um, manages four facilities in Edmonton, Canada. And I asked her, I said, how do you deal with this diversity and inclusion thing and, and ethnic diversity in, you know, on your team? And she literally stopped and looked at me and went, she couldn't actually understand the question because it was so foreign to her, because her team is so diverse. Now understand, I am Canadian born and raised. When I grew up in Canada, there was no diversity in aquatics. So to understand how far that country has come since I've left really took me for a bit of a loop. Down here, these are some wonderful people. Stacy Pigeon, uh, who is a New Zealander over in Australia. Um, Dr. Marion Lynch with Diversity and Aquatics in the USA. And Danielle Obe, Black Swimming Association president, who's been going for a couple of years and amazing work they're doing. And I asked Danielle Obe, or actually I asked the whole group, I said, is diversity and inclusion, because I wasn't using JEDI at that point, is it a thing? Should we be thinking about this internationally? Should we be thinking about it locally? And she said, it's not a thing, it's the thing. It is a whole foundation, essentially, is what she said. And that really struck me, that whole idea of why isn't it part of our foundation of everything we do? Done a lot of research, looking at different papers, around for various, various things and happened upon this. Hands up if you've seen this before. I'm sure some people in here might have, maybe not. Oh, dear. OK. I would encourage you to look at this, because I think it's really, really important. Life-saving Victoria multicultural program been going for years and years. They actually did a study 
$1 investment, $14.85 return. Boom, pocketbook. That's the value of what they're doing. And when you look at what they're doing, water safety awareness, but it goes well beyond that. Health, social connection, anti-racism, employment, training, organizational diversity, all these things they're hitting with this program. And it started out as a water safety program. Again, water connects us. It goes beyond what we're looking at. And I've believed this for a long time. We keep asking for funding for water safety. Why are we not asking for funding for what we actually do, which is all that? Notice at the top, can be funded for. And it led to these young women, that program. So these young women are ones that came out of that program. Second place, silver medalist, Victoria Championships, 2021. Couldn't swim three years beforehand. Most of them are refugees, or former refugees now. All of them hijab wearing. And when they gave the interviews, there are two main things that they highlighted. Number one, the person that came to talk at their school looked like them. I, th I believe he was actually a former Afghan refugee. Second thing, immediately what popped into their head, they don't want to give up their hijab. That they all said that in the interviews. So um, Life Saving Victoria went and did it and got the different swim costumes, set it up, and champions. We've got other pools of people to draw from that we're not drawing from simply because we don't have the structures for it. Looking internationally, I didn't start my timer. Looking internationally, I'm not going to get into the whole <laughs> that issue. I will say that when one side is saying science is on my side, and then the other side is saying science is on my side, maybe we need to talk a bit more on what's going on, and maybe we need a little bit more research. I'll leave it there. This one, has anybody heard of this kerfuffle that happened with Finna? That's pretty interesting because it made international news pretty big. Swim caps. A company applied, hey, we want your Olympians to wear our swim caps. Finna said, and this, this is pretty much where it went wrong. We don't see why swimmers will wear those swim caps because they're not really streamlined. So no, there's no purpose for them. Tell that to all these women and men <laughs> who need to wear those swim caps. And it's a significant, my sister, it was a three hour chore to do her hair. The whole house stopped <laughs> because it was hair time. This is a thing. This is the thing that we go through as a people that a lot of people don't realize because they don't go through that same thing. I want to applaud this. This is right here at home. Inclusive swim swimmer policy. Has everybody heard of this policy change? Really, really applaud this because what they've done is they've completely opened the window to competition with different kinds of swimwear. Love it. I would have chosen a different picture. Not quite as diverse as I'd like, but there you go. I'll take it. This is awesome. Nobody knows about it yet. I did a program with young people of Somali descent, young women, who all love to swim and want to compete. Their community doesn't know about this yet. So I'm big on going, hey, how do we get this to the community again? This is what I'm trying to do, and this is what I want the industry to do, really connect with these kind of things. They matter. They're important. Um, yeah, so that's where we get to the whole dealing with local industry. And when I say local, I mean Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's been an interesting five-year journey. I've had some massive support from the industry, amazing, in pushing some of this stuff forward. And I've had some resistance to it. And it's been an interesting one to navigate how the industry works in New Zealand. And I'm still learning and I'm still growing. But this is one thing that felt like it was in the way. I constantly got the feeling that, you know, ethnic communities and diversity is important, but it's not the main thing we need to do right now. We've got other things to do first. We'll get to you in a bit. That's me, my family, all the people that I work with. And I'm going, they're important too, and they're also dying. 
And when I looked at the international literature, a lot of it looks at ethnic communities specifically, but marginalized communities in general as having a disproportionate amount of drowning and looks at it on a per capita basis. And I couldn't find it here. Now, and somebody in here might tell me that it, is, it does exist. I haven't found it yet. So I went and ran the numbers on my own with the stats from Water Safety New Zealand. The blue categories are ones that are under 1.5 per 100,000. Yellow categories are over 1.5 per 100,000. And those two red categories, over three. And you can see this is over a five-year period of time. New Zealand European, born in New Zealand, steadily decreasing. Everybody else either staying exactly where they are, Maori, off the chart, acutely off the chart. This worries me coming into this new year. And I'm sitting there going, why aren't we raising alarms about this? Look at this. And my question was, do we have a social justice problem in aquatics and water safety? And I asked that as a question, something that we need to talk about. Because if we keep saying, oh, look, we need to teach more people to swim, obviously other stuff is going on that we need to address. And it's the hard stuff to address and the stuff we don't want to talk about, but we need to talk about it. And we need to talk about it now because, look, the country's under stress, COVID, other things, economy, and you see things start to go wonky. Again, questions, and I love anybody who has the ability to dive deeper into this, please do. I'm not a statistician, but I have questions. Stats overall, we're looking at, this is 2018. In other conversations, in ethnic communities, there's a lot of conversations about these. The categorization, the othering. So technically, I'm an other. I don't even fall on the map because I wrap up too much of this, how we interpret all this. But if you look at the numbers and you start looking European, and remember the whole idea of intersectionality, a lot of these cross over. But look at Maori, Asian, Middle Eastern. We tend to look at them separately and try and treat them separately. But if we put them all together, is the quote unquote mainstream that much bigger than everybody else? And we're not designing for everybody else in general. And again, my perspective. If you look at what's going to happen in the future, Asian population by 2040 is going to be 26% of the country, quote unquote Asian area. This dynamic in this country is going to change dramatically over the next few years. Australia is already gone. They tipped the scale. The majority of their country is now either immigrant or born to immigrants, official. And we're not even counting all the rest of it. LGBTQ, neurodiversity, age, all the things that we were talking about on the stage in the other room. This whole idea of intersectionality is incredibly important. We don't all fall in one category. So I think somebody said 70 something percent of people need some accessibility support in programs. This is what we're starting to see. So again, a question, and this is something over the past five years I ask really from a good place. What is the mainstream taking care of? And is it taking care of everybody? Because for me, mainstream should be the system that encompasses everybody, that tries to reach out and pull and support. And then you can have specific programs for those who need specific assistance. But we don't go creating separate programs for somebody and they still don't have access to the mainstream system. And this is what I feel and what I see in the past years in New Zealand. And this is coming from me being in the education system with my stepchildren as well, who are Maori. I see the separation. I'm going, number one, why? And number two, thinking about, especially from a term of Maori, many of us who are ethnic will gravitate more towards models that are Maori than we would towards those who are characteristically mainstream. But yet, those models are not embedded within the mainstream system. I think we have work to do. Is this relevant to all of you? I think so. Recruitment, retention, safety, well-being, client pool, where are you going to get your clients from as the demographics change? Your competitive edge internationally. Some of your best competitors might be in 
populations that you're not serving yet. Business planning, what is the business model moving forward as our dynamics and wills and the interests of each community changes? And sources of funding, remember, can be funded for. And I'm big on that. If we can actually use our funding more wisely and make it more impactful to different areas, why not? So I'm not here to teach how <laughs> for this one. That's a long conversation. I will say that whenever I do workshops like this, I think foundation policy, structure and tools, and then your individual journey commitment. And it must be one of the, or it starts in one of these, but it has to encompass all three eventually. It has to spread out to all three. It can't run on two. And I'll highlight, you do hear a lot that it's going to be a long journey, and yes, it's going to be a long journey, but it's not a journey that, start, that you can put off. It's a long, intense journey over time. And that's something to keep in mind. It's not, well, we'll get to that later. We need to start it now. We need to think about it now. And it means we need to do it for a long time for it to actually take hold. And then I go back to that Canadian context. That's 25 years since I left Canada that that's happened. But sustained effort is the thing. And I'll end on this one. Martin Luther King, but I'm a sailor. So that's what I do and we don't leave anybody behind. So even if it's one person on board, you're going to risk your ship, and your crew will gladly risk themselves to save that one. And I wonder whether, as an industry, we can start taking on that tone in how we look at things. And that's me, and I have no idea how long I took. Uh, 30 minutes. Awesome. <clears throat>